Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 29th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. And this video is done um, specifically for serious Roman Catholics. I want to give you a, an idea of what's going on. What is happening? <clears throat> because I feel your pain. Uh, you know, the Scripture says when one member of the body suffers, the entire body does. And that's true. Christ has only one church. All who belong to him are his church, as the Catholic Catechism says, states very well. So although I, I don't identify as a, a Roman Catholic, I, I'm a, I belong to Jesus Christ. That's the best way to describe me. I belong to him. Forty-seven years ago, he saved this wretched sinner out of a deep, dark hole, and uh, I've belonged to him ever since. I have not been a particularly faithful servant. But I am his. He purchased me. He's the one that, that paid the price for this worthless servant, but nevertheless, nevertheless. So I, I want to give you a little heads up about what's going on. I know uh, things are bad in Roman Catholicism right now. And I want to point you to a couple of scriptures right away to give you an idea of what's going on. The, the, God's aware of it. Jesus Christ is, is actually behind what's going on, in a way. In a way. So uh, this is uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse, starting at verse 26 here. And I'll be reading from the uh, New American Bible, uh, which is a 2011 Catholic translation. It's generally a good translation. Uh, it's a little rocky as far as the English at times. It's not very, sometimes it's hard to, uh, it's quite literal. <laughs> of course, Greek isn't English. So. <laughs> but it's, uh, I'd say it's a dependable translation. Oh, so, but because I'm talking to Catholics, I want to use, I don't, you know, sometimes Catholics don't want to hear from any Bible that's not uh, properly stamped. And let's see, can I, uh, so just <laughs> in case you don't know what the, the this one is, um, no, it doesn't actually show it there, does it? Oh, I can, I can make it come up. There, let's see, there's the information on it. In case you're wondering, you probably know this, though. So. I'd say it's the, it's the common Catholic translation nowadays in English. So, uh... I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of the crisis that's going on among Catholics right now, serious Catholics. Nominal Catholics, you know, they're indifferent. They're not paying attention. I was following uh, what happened in 2019 in October at the Amazonian Synod. And I also read Francis's Laudato Si prior to that, and I've read his recent one, his, what, Laudate Deum? Um, and I read the, the text of his, uh, blessing irregular couples. Uh, I, I thought the, uh, the reaction to that was probably more than was warranted by the content, uh, specifically because, but it was, it was, what do we say? Double. There's a lot of double speak in that in that thing. All those forty five uh, paragraphs had a lot of double speak in it. Uh, the way I take that, by the way, is basically preparation for what's coming down the road. He just get wanting people to get comfortable, more comfortable with what he has in mind, or his successor does, which he's pretty much rigged. Uh, but I want you to know what's really going on behind the scenes, as far as God's concerned, as far as Christ is concerned. This is not simply this crisis in Roman Catholicism, and indeed it is. And I'm going to tell you what the crisis is and where your choice is and where you're going to have to follow. You're going to have to make some serious decisions. And all of us in our lives have this. So, this um, And as a bit of an outsider, my, my in-laws were are, are Catholic, uh, my father and mother-in-law were pretty devout Catholics. 
Uh, they've passed away now, but uh, their children not quite so much. But uh, so I'm, I'm not. Uh, what I want to do is, is, is help you navigate what's going on. Um, again, I, I belong to Jesus Christ, and if you belong to Jesus Christ, we're brothers and sisters. So, uh, so let's look at the scripture here, Hebrews 12, starting at verse 26. I'll just read two verses here, or try to read it. I'm not used to this translation, but it's, it looks okay. His voice shook the earth at that time. Uh, the writer of Hebrews here is referring to uh, the law of Moses, when God gave the law of Moses and God spoke from the mountain and there was earthquakes and fire and the people were terrified. Uh, his voice uh, shook the earth at that time, but now uh, he has promised, I will once more shake not only earth but heaven. This phrase once more points to the removal of shaken created things, so that what is unshakable, or unshaken, excuse me, unshaken may remain. Okay, so what is he saying there? What he's saying is that, that God is going to shake things in order that that which is permanent, eternal, and enduring may remain, and everything that can, can be shaken and fall apart will fall apart. Everything that is built based on man will fall down. The house built on sand. Jesus' is parable about the sand, house built on the sand and the house built on the rock. Of course, he himself is the rock. His words are the rock. The words, of, the words that aren't his are shakable. They're sand. Sand just turns into liquid when you shake it. Uh, it, it has no, you don't build a building on sand. No. And, of course, water just washes it away. And that's the point of his parable. What are what are what is your foundation resting on? Now let's go to one more uh, scripture portion that's related to this. So what's the purpose of this shaking that we're seeing globally right now? Everything in this whole world is shaking everywhere you look. Ephesians chapter five, starting at verse twenty-three, uh, he inserts this. He's talking about. Uh, marriage here, but he inserts this in there. He says, husbands, love your wife, your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her, talking about his crucifixion, handing himself over to be crucified, to sanctify her, to set her apart to God, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word. Of course, we are baptized into Christ. We are set apart from the world to Christ in baptism. That he might present to himself the church in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That's the purpose of this shaking, to get the church ready for the coming of her bridegroom. I should have probably showed you the scripture there, right? I'm a one-man band here, so sometimes I don't. I'm thinking while I'm doing this. It's not scripted. And sometimes I don't push the right buttons at the right time. Sorry about that. I am what I am. I'm a man of, a fallible man. Uh, so, <clears throat> what's the crisis in the Roman Catholic Church? Crisis of authority. Uh, and a crisis of the conflict between God's Word and tradition. And Francis, the, Francis the Destroyer, <laughs> has brought this to a head, and you can't escape it. You can't escape it. And God is using this for his purposes. I said, don't be afraid. I, 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 that's, if there's one message I want you to have, it's don't be afraid. It is Christ who is at work. If you belong to him, he's going to keep you. He's going to protect you. He's going to hold, you, uh, uh, hold on to you. It may feel at times you're in water over your head and you're about to drown, but Christ is there, okay? Uh, 
You know, I've been through some times like that. So, yes, Christ is there. You may not feel like it, but he's there. And I've been watching you. Uh, I've been watching the crisis. And, uh, I, I, you know, like you, you have uh, conservative. In fact, recently it's uh, uh, you've been shaken again, probably uh, church militant. Uh, of course, Michael Voris, we he fell. He turned out to be uh, a man of clay, too, like the rest of us. And it, putting confidence in someone other than Christ, um, well, the, there's a, been a lot of people that like that, that seem to be uh, holier than they really are. <laughs> and then something happens, and they sh- are exposed as as being less than that. So that's we shouldn't put our confidence in shakable things, but that which is unshakable, which is Christ and God's Word. He's not shakable. He's eternal. So let's uh, do that. I, I, and I, but I want to uh, think I can help you with what's going on, understanding a little bit. I think God has given me a gift of understanding things. I can look at things and pretty much understand what's going on. <laughs> It works good if you're an engineer, which I used to be. You can look at a problem and, hmm, yeah. But I, I don't want to claim it's my ability. I mean, it's uh, the things I did to my body and my brain are it's like it's God's grace that I can. I'm not dead or in a wheelchair drooling someplace in a nursing home. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> he took me out of a deep, dark hole, I'll tell you. Uh, if you know the uh, the biblical story of uh, Jesus uh, delivering the demoniac of the Gadarenes, that's uh, pretty close to my story. I have a lot of, uh, what do you say, a lot in common with that, with that particular miracle of Christ. So God's purpose is to remove what's shakable, what's not eternal, what's not of him, and to purify his bride because the bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. Not 10,000 years from now. The signs of the times. You know, this earth can only hold a certain number of people sustainably, and we're already past that. Um, The whole green agenda, well, that'll cause a massive depopulation of the planet. But God put enough resources here for this time. Enough to get us by until he returns. And then he can fix everything. Now, the scripture warns us of this time, of the, uh, it's going to be difficult. Jesus said in the last days, difficult times would come. Or uh, The apostle Paul did. Well, Christ did too. He, he spoke Christ especially. Uh, particularly in Matthew 24, speaks of a time of, of uh, uh, multiplying, or I'd, I'd use the word exploding, lawlessness. And that's what we see in this world today, is it not? Look at the government. Look at the American government. All these people are lawless. The president is lawless. The Congress is lawless. Um, regardless of party, they're, they're lawless. One party more than the other. Right now, there's this utter lawlessness. They use law as a weapon, as a political weapon. That's lawlessness. They don't respect anything. Uh, they're just whatever in for in it's for me. I'm gonna. I don't care about law. I don't care about justice. I just want what I want. Uh, and the the which is, I believe, that that's really what we should think of as original sin, not so much. Uh, well, th- in this sense, that. When Adam fell, the the relationship between God and Adam was broken. And Adam became, we were made to be the image of God. We were made to be the temple of God. Uh, And to be the image of God requires God in you. Only God can be the image of God. So he must be in you, dwelling in you to be his image in creation. And when Adam sinned, that relationship was broken, and Adam died spiritually. He was I, th- I think Augustine talks about this, too, sin as the absence of good, and not so much a, a, a reality that stands alone. It's like darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness doesn't have any existence other than 
uh, in relationship to light. The same thing uh, Jesus said, there's none good but God alone. And so only God is good, and in order to be good, you have to have God in you. Which is what Jesus talks about in in, uh, John chapter 3. You must be born again. Uh, You must have a new creation in you, a new spirit. Uh, You must have the new covenant where God promises a new spirit and a new heart. And fortunately, Catholics are actually much better than that than a lot of evangelicals and and Baptists that seem to be utterly ignorant in certain things. Um, Actually, Catholics have a more biblical idea of church than a lot of others, too. Unfortunately, there's a little problem there. Christ has one church, but when you identify a particular institution with that church, it can get a little distorted. So, and that's part of the problem you're you're having right now. Um, what you're facing with Francis, Francis the pagan, because that's the best way to describe Francis is the pagan. Um, I th- I think uh, Archbishop Vigano has described him quite well too, and others, Schneider and others. Um, he is not a Christian. Again, I read Laudato Si. That man's not a Christian. I watched him, what he did at in St. Peter's in October 2019 with the pagan idols. Those Pachamamas are not images of Mary being pregnant. That is Mother Earth deities and bringing in the the shamans and shamanesses and the canoe, all these items of worship. And perhaps you didn't know, but one of the preliminary uh, documents in preparation for that synod, which I have on my hard drive someplace, uh, in that document they talk about taking talking about the the bread and the wine of the mass, and it and. It, in that document, of course, this is all signed off on by uh, good old Francis. He talks about the bread not being the body of Christ, but representing wheat. And the wine represents not the blood of Christ, not being the blood of Christ, but the wine represents the water of life, the Amazon. So the, the fact that he is, a, is attempting to wipe out the traditional Latin mass makes perfect sense because he hates it. He hates Christianity. He hates genuine Christianity. And in it, he hates Christ crucified. And that's the center of Catholic worship. Regardless of whatever else, the traditions, that still remains the center. That's always been the center for all true Christians everywhere, whether you're Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, whatever, except for some fringe groups that are really off. Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead is what Christianity centers on. He is our center. And he is our koinonia, our joint fellowship. We all possess him together, and he possesses us together. That is the one true church, his people. As the Catholic Catechism rightly says. Now, are there inconsistencies in there? Yes. Yeah, I know they used to say that outside the church there is no salvation, which is a truism. Outside the church of Jesus Christ, all who belong to him, there is no salvation. But the problem is when you say, and this is your difficulty, one of your difficulties, that to be part of the one true church, you must be in communion with the Pope. Well, that hasn't been true for a long time, since at least the Great Schism was 1054. And there was other schisms before that. What, what causes those schisms? Some of its groups bring in false doctrine. Other times it is, uh, which isn't really schism, A schism, even that Catholic encyclopedia doesn't have a very good definition of this. A division in the in the body of Christ caused by um, different opinions, man's ideas, things that that don't come from Christ Himself, that aren't part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, and that brings in division. 
So the, the crisis you have today is this, this struggle between, uh, I mean, the, 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 your, the statements of the Roman Catholic Church on the authority of Scripture are very strong. Vatican I is very strong on that. You have that it, it, it is infallible, and it is authoritative. It is God's inspired work. But the problem is you have uh, tradition next to it, equal to it, but it doesn't. In, tradition is not does not have the is not infallible, and tradition is not God's inspired word delivered once for all to the saints, as the Scripture says. So we have um, you have these doctrines about the development of of doctrine and tradition and everything else. We have to distinguish that. If you don't, you end up with the crisis you've got now. So here's the issue. You've got a pope that is manifestly not a Christian, that's seeking to destroy Christianity. There's no other way to put it. He's a, a green socialist that wants to normalize LGBTQ, apparently, gradually, so you don't really know what's going on. But you know what's going on. This has happened to others before. I've seen it happen to other churches, <clears throat> which I've seen the process. You gradually, you keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until people get worn out. Wear down the saints. Satan's plan, wear down the saints. Until you finally give up. Well, the saints can't give up. Can't do that. So, what the decision you're you've got? You're you're on a fork in the road. You're, you're traveling down the road. Of course, we're on. We're supposed to be on the, the the narrow way. Christ said, talks about the narrow way that leads to life. Well, what's the narrow way? He's the narrow way. What's the narrow gate? He's the narrow gate. Christ Himself. He he. It's, it's the church is all about Him. We're His people. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our God. It's about Christ. He's what all Christians hold in common, all real Christians. If you don't have him, if his spirit doesn't dwell on you, according to the Apostle Paul, you don't belong to him. So we're going down this, this, this path, the narrow way, and there's a fork in the road. And one side has a sign on it that says, Christ, follow me. The other side says, Francis, follow me. You have to choose. Are you going to follow Christ or are you going to follow Francis? Because they're not walking together. They're going like this. They're diverging. So you can't, you have to choose one way or the other. There's only one right way. And Francis isn't the right way. So making that choice, but you, you've got this dilemma, this crisis, because the Vatican I, and usually the, the conservative Catholics today, from what I've seen, and I'm probably aware of as much as more than most Catholics, Again, I don't identify as a Catholic other than with a small c. I could say, because Christ has one church, one universal church. Uh, I don't identify that with an organization, though, just like, you know, it's, no, it's Christ himself. It's spiritual. It's not visible, because Christ is not visible. How can his church be visible? We're not visible until he makes himself visible, too, when he comes. The ap apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, and we will be unveiled with him as we truly are. We will see him as he is for we, because we will be like him at that time, the glorification of the saints. All right, so you, you, you've, you've got this crisis, and you have to make a choice. And the problem, the, the, the difficulty in the crisis, if it was just between Francis and Christ, I mean, there is no choice, right? There's not a problem there. You want to go with Christ. You don't want to go with Francis because you know what he is. But Vatican I says he's infallible. And it says he's infallible whenever, whenever he speaks as the Pope. It's not just some special condition. If you read the, uh, the, the doctrine on that, it is very clear, clear that when he speaks as 
the the bishop of Rome as the, uh, uh, with a teaching authority like Laudato Si or any encyclical really, or he is giving a instruction for the the, the church as a whole, uh, as from his office as the pope. Well, that's infallible according to Vatican I. So now you have yourself in a, in a dilemma. You've got an infallible antichrist, an infallible abomination of desolation, to use Vigano's expression, one of his expressions. He, he pretty let lose uh, a, a full broadside on Francis. Um, yeah. Not the only one. Schneider's been pretty good at that, too. Those are two men I'd like to sit down and have a cup of coffee with sometimes. Yeah, not both at once, so. <laughs> men I can respect. Just like those young men that threw the Pachamamas in the Tiber. They should have burned them. Wood floats. <laughs> Youth, they make mistakes like that. Uh, chopped them up first or something. Run them through a wood chipper. No loss. Use him to start a barbecue grill. Something. Or throw Francis in the Tiber. That'd be an idea. Oh, it's probably... Wouldn't be the first time a pope's been tossed in the Tiber. Uh, so what do you do? You're, I see, you're in this condition. You're, you've got this tradition. Uh, the Vatican I says, not that the, there weren't claims of this before, but officially Vatican I makes the pope infallible when he's in his capacity as teacher, when he's speaking as pope. Not when he's ordering his lunch, but when he's speaking as pope. And there's people try to get around that, but it's, it's not really something you can get around. So what do you do when the pope turns out to be a false teacher, a false prophet, an antichrist? Because he is anti antichristos. He's... He claims to be the vicar of Christ, the substitute, the, the Greek word, the prefix anti means both uh, uh, substitute for or it means against. And Francis's case is both. And it's antichristos is the vicar of Christ. That would be how you'd translate that to Greek. Uh, and he is. And he exalts himself, too. The, Paul talks about the man of sin, exalts himself over all that is called God or all that is regarded as holy. And that's what he does. Uh, Francis, when he, he annulled the biblical commandment, of go, going back to the time of Noah, Noah where God said, uh, he that sheds man, uh, man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. He just annulled that. And uh, he changed the Lord's Prayer. He doesn't like, uh, lead us not into temptation. And Francis has said, oh, I don't like that, so I'd change it. Who does he think he is? Well, he must be thinks he's greater than God. He can't believe in the God of the Scripture, clearly. And now, of course, he wants to bless what God calls an abomination. Although that document is written in such a vague way, a Jesuistical way, that <clears throat> I, again, I think it's just a way to 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 prepare people for the full thing. I can't think of any greater abomination than, than uh, uh, welcoming people in that kind of a abominable sin, living in that kind of a lifestyle, to receive communion. I mean, isn't that not the abomination that makes desolate? That's worse. That would be even beyond bringing the Pachamama idols and their priests and worship right in front of of the high altar in St. Peter's. Isn't that giving God the finger right there? Wasn't, wasn't that what Francis and the hierarchy were doing? Like a lot of these people standing there looking at what is going on here? I mean, the videos are still up. I mean, you can go to, well, plus they're in hard drives in various places around the world. Well, you can, you can go to the Vatican uh, website and look at those things. I mean, it's right there. And Francis is right in the middle of it. They're even putting a pagan ring on his finger. He did slip it off. But... 
So one of the one of the shamanesses put a ring on Francis's finger. What can you say? And they, you know, then then before that they were out in the, the Vatican Garden and they were planting a holy tree and doing all their stuff out there, worshiping the Pachamamas, along with a bunch of Franciscan monks and nuns and the clergy and bishops and cardinals and Francis and pagan oh, Lord. And what happened a month after that? COVID hit. A month after, COVID hit. You want to go give God the middle finger in what's supposed to be his place, his holy place? You think nothing's going to happen? That was an abomination that made desolate. The Vatican was soon empty. That's what the word desolate means, empty, from COVID. Remember? So you have a, a difficult choice to make. You're going to have to choose between Christ and Francis, between God's word and tradition. Tradition cannot be equal because Vatican I is tradition. Either God's word is higher than man's word or man's word is higher than God's word. Francis represents the latter. Obviously. He represents what the Bible calls the man of sin, the Antichrist, because he exalts himself over God. And that's what people do when they, when they, or that's what the Pharisees did. As Jesus said, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. That's what the, the Orthodox Jews do to, the, to, this, to this very day. The Talmud is nothing but the opinions of rabbis. And that's one of the reasons we have genocide going on in Gaza today because some of those opinions in that book are abominable. They didn't get, that genocide comes from someplace, and it's called the Talmud. The attitude in the rabbis, among the, some of those rabbis toward non-Jews, is what we see going on in the world today. <clears throat> but you have this choice to make. I just want, you have to choose Christ. He'll keep you safe. It's not an easy decision to make, but you have to make it. You have to make it. And, it, you know, when the communists were persecuting Christians, you have that outside persecution. That is much easier than what's happening now. When you have Satan inside the church. Who was that pope that talked about the smoke of Satan entering the sanctuary? Yeah, apparently has. Uh, but this is this is beyond the pale now. There's no no possibility of fudging it. And just going back to 1950 is not going to solve the problem. I mean, we all want to go back to 1950, right? Except I wouldn't be around. <laughs> but when the world's at least appeared to be some uh, simpler. Of course, the, the the threat of nuclear annihilation. I remember when I was young, I was hanging over everything too. So it's it's oh, we just tend to forget some of that stuff. But there's a choice you have. You, you see, this is a choice you you cannot avoid. It's remember when Jesus said to Peter that they'll the day will come when they take you where you don't do not want to go. Well, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to go to the, where you have to make this decision, but there's, there's no, you have no choice. You have to choose Christ or Francis, Christ or tradition. And the choice of Christ takes you back to the faith delivered once for all to the saints, takes you back to the teaching of the apostles. 
There's nothing wrong with that. You have to understand that you can let go everything that is shakable. And tradition is shakable. Because you can see where it's taking you. Francis, if Francis is infallible and you hold to that, if you hold to Francis, well, he's on the broad way that leads to destruction, not the narrow way that leads to eternal life. So if, if you, you know, we, it's the same way with the world. You, to be a Christian is to be set apart to Christ, and we're not of the world anymore. So we all have this to one degree or another at various times, but it's much harder when the corruption is inside what is called the Church of Jesus Christ. Because how do we deal with that? We don't want to see that we, because we're these people are not Christ. Or the Pope is supposed to be a teacher, not an antichrist. But he is. So this choice is forced upon you, and you have to make it. And if you, once you make that, all tradition unrolls. You, it's like layers that have accumulated over the years. So, so you first of all, you have to jettison Pope Francis. But a lot of you also say, well, Vatican II is a problem. Okay. Well, Vatican II talks about, you know, it says, well, we're just teaching what Vatican I taught. But Vatican I is, is what officially uh, empowers the Pope as infallible. So Vatican I's got to go. And it's a never-ending process until you get back to the original teaching, until you get back to the teaching of the apostles, which is sufficient. The faith delivered once for all unto the saints. It's what's written in the New Testament. You can't find anything that you can trace back that's not written in the New Testament that was delivered by the apostles. You know, there's this, just like the Jews, uh, they talked to the Pharisees, talked about the the traditions of the elders that supposedly Moses gave, the verbal secret tradition. Well, that's the same thing that, that developed in Roman Catholicism and in others, the idea that, that there was unwritten things that were passed down, but nobody can show you where they are. Because the, the Scripture says, once for all delivered to the saints. Complete it with the apostles. It was enough. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. Because what do we need to know? Christ. He is our Savior. Anything that points us away from Him is dangerous. That which points us to Him is trustworthy. So you're going to have a difficult time ahead. Just hold to Christ. Trust him in him. He will walk you through it. He promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you, even to the end of the age. And that's about where we are now, coming up to the end of the age. And things are going to get shaky. The whole world is shaking. Uh, governments around this world are shaking. Look at the problems we got in Washington here. We've got an utterly lawless government. Again, the, the two major signs Jesus gives in Matthew 24 is this exploding lawlessness, the, the major increase in lawlessness, and also because of that, he said, the love of many, I would translate that as the majority uh, from the Greek, the majority will grow cold. Because of the lawlessness. How can you avoid that? Cling to Jesus Christ himself. You can't cling to men, to women, to anything but Christ. He is our Savior. He is the one who loved us so much that he delivered himself to that cross to die for our sins. And his sacrifice is, co is complete and sufficient. Jesus said, he that trusts in me has what? Eternal life. It's him. He is our salvation. 
He is Christianity. He is the core. He is what we all possess in common. Do not fear. He has not abandoned us. He is walking with us, preparing his bride for his return. 